and welcome round to my house. Now, I'm joined today in Hampshire by a legendary French baker and a South African chef who has become one of the most influential women in the food world. And together, we're going to be laying on a mouth-watering selection of dishes for the star of TV's hottest new drama and two singing sensations who have come together to conquer the charts. So what are we doing out here? Let's get inside. Let's get cooking. Morning. Are you coming in then? Good morning, and what a show we've got lined up for today. Today's a special one. A good friend of the show, Denise Van Alten, will be back. Hey! She's also bringing Duncan James with her as well. <laughs> That's the super van that is Sam on autocue, keeping her locked away. Uh, he'll be here as well. And I'll be cooking for the star of every chef's favourite new drama when Boiling Point's Vinette Robinson's dropped by. <laughs> And I'll be joining Pork Pies, courtesy of the very talented Knox Majorsi will be back as well. Yeah. And I'll be showcasing how to make a classic custard in this week's Little Master. That's, that doesn't get a round of applause. Not yet, anyway, hopefully. <laughs> uh, and that's not all, because I'll be joined by a friend of the show who's no stranger to early mornings, thanks to the years he's spent as his trade in bakeries in Brittany. It's the brilliant Richard Bertone! Thank you, thank you. Wonderful having you on the show, Chief. Oh, Great pleasure. to have you back. Always, we always. love your food every time you come thank on. Thank you. It's very, very special. But this is really, really special. I've seen these. You've brought them in. <laughs> What on earth are these? They look like puff balls, these things. What? Yeah, the magic mushroom. The magic mushroom. <laughs> the, the, the bread that... What, what is it? How do you... What, what is it? It just do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you call it? What is it? Is it... It's just a puff ball, magic puff ball. And what we're going to do is um, an inverted salad. So instead of the crouton in the salad, the yeah. crouton will be your base. Okay. So, yeah, a bit more later, don't worry. So, you sort of build this up and you fill, fill it inside. From underneath. There you go. Oh, that's what it is. There you go. It's, it really is spectacular. You're not going to want to miss that one. But we're kicking these off today with a dish of lamb that I'm going to serve with an incredible olive glaze. Uh, so, we've got some beautiful lamb over here. I've got some Barnsley chops. Gorgeous Barnsley chops. You can tell the Barnsley chops because they're joined together. Really, really good Barnsley chops. So we've always got the little fillet underneath, which is this has got yep. as well. So, we're going to take a little bit of seasoning. And just simply cook these on the grill, because we're going to go to Greece. Now, I know you went to Greece this year as well. Oh, Yeah, on holiday. First, first time, all-inclusive holiday. First <laughs> time. First time, all-inclusive holiday. so good. Did so, nothing. <laughs> so we're going to cook these, because we're going to introduce you to somebody who's not far away from you in Bath. I know. To Zoe. I think you've met before as well. We're yeah, going to introduce exciting. you in a minute. But yeah. all about this amazing Greek produce. But what I want to do is get this lamb on first of all, and then really go through what I'm going to do in mm. terms of the olive glaze. So this is the tapenade. We'll get on with Zoe's tapenade in a second, but this is an amazing sort of French chef, Eric Chaveau. Yep. Uh, as you know, is one of the legends in the, the industry, really. And there are restaurants all over the place, as Eric, multiple Michelin stars. He did this sort of lamb dish, and I remember him doing it, and it was a glaze using olives, yep. like a tapenade, yep. with stock syrup. And you, blend, in there, yeah? and you blend it together and serve it over the top of lamb. So you just tap it with a traditional French tap Traditional ta tapenade, you, you just blend it together with sugar there. syrup. Yeah. Wow. And it was just glazed over the lamb chops once they're cooked. Not on now, because they're just going to burn. <laughs> but just glazed over the lamb chops to finish off the, the cooking of it. You get this amazing umami flavour with it. So all I'm going to do is just take a touch of this. Just grab a little pan over here. Grab one from over there. The sugar syrup is like 50-50. 50-50. Yep. So a little bit of stock syrup. You can see that's nice and thick. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. And then I'm going to warm this up. Just serve it on the little side of this. I'm going to warm it up and then just add the tapenade with it and then just blend it. Just nice, nicely, quickly blend it. And then I'm going to glaze all the sort of lamb chops with it as we're doing it. So that can sit on the side there. Now, like I said, we're going to go back to your neck of the woods now. So it feels yep. like you're home from home for this next bit because I know. Yeah, we're going to go to Bath for this one. Bath so Road. we're about to go to uh, uh, speak to Zoe Baldry uh, from Raphael's Mediterranean Deli. There you are, Zoe. The sun is shining. It is indeed. Good morning, this, this, Mr. Watson. Good morning. It's great to have you on the show as well. Now, I, I'm a great fan of the produce that we've got. You've kindly sent us in front of me as well. But tell us a little bit about the backstory, how it all started. Because you, your parents started producing all this, not Greek. Mm -hmm. they, 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 tell us about them. And, and they ended up over in Greece and they fell in love with it. Indeed. So um, my dad was on his way to India 
and stumbled across this lovely little island called Skiapos and uh, ended up staying 50 years. He got to India a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> 50 years they've yeah. been there. And, and they, they were then producing their own food to then sell at markets. Was that right? Is that how That's it all correct. started? Yes. And, and so you... a, a small market garden that then grew and grew. Um, my dad would take them veggies down to the town in different areas and sell to the local townsfolk. Um, and there's a brilliant story where there was a local priest and a couple of ladies who ended up getting in a bit of a barn fight over the green beans. <laughs> so t tell us about the produce that you started importing and how did that work? Um, I heard a little rumour that you, you sort of loaded up your car, headed back to the UK and started selling the produce. How was that, first of all? Must have been quite difficult to start with, though, wasn't it? Um, it was. Well, I come from a history of hospitality background myself. So when I moved to Bath for my son to go to school here, um, I thought maybe I'd open up a little Greek restaurant. But Bath is inundated with amazing independent restaurants already. Yeah. Um, and I decided to change the route slightly and start supplying into the independent restaurants here in Bath with my olive oil and olives. Um, and Michelin star chefs use the product. So I thought, why, why not open it up to the bigger market? Um, and then everything else just kind of evolved. I missed the flavors of the you know, products that my mum would make from all the vegetables in the garden. And I decided, why not start bringing them over? Tell us about what makes Greek olive oil, and particularly all around those islands. It's very, very special, this sort of stuff as well. Unique in terms of taste and flavor. What makes mm -hmm. this different? So um, it's a single variety olive. It's from the area of Kolibari, just outside of Khanya Crete. And it's from, made from the Koroneiko variety of olive. And it just tastes of sunshine, really. It's buttery, it's got a slightly grassy aftertaste, um, but it's not too bitter or yes, scratchy at the back of your throat. It's very balanced, isn't it, yeah, do you think? Balanced. Sometimes it's too, too uh, harsh on the throat. Yeah. This is beautiful, really, really nice. It, it, Indeed. And it, it pairs amazingly with your bread, Richard. Uh, I know that. Exactly. <laughs> now, it's interesting you said Crete, because I, I went to Crete, and apparently they consume more olive oil than any other uh, country per, per person. Oh, really? Yearly. Uh, oh, I yeah. believe about a litre a day. They deep fry it, they do yeah. everything. I mean, everything. Yeah, everything with it. But you've got a selection of other things that you've got over here that I'm going to use throughout this as well. So I'm going to make a, a nice little platter that we've got on here. You kindly done the job for me, really, Zoe. So, so <laughs> I'm going to start you. off with this one, because... This I tasted, this is spectacular. This is a, like a little passata, your sort of um, tomato, saffron sort of taste with it as well? Yes. So this is one of my best sellers. It's called Sunshine Sauce. Sunshine um, Sauce. Got... Yeah. <laughs> um, and it goes amazingly also with things like butter beans or chickpeas or some pan-fried halloumi. Or you can even use it as a base for a saganaki with some shrimps and feta cheese and parsley. Very clean, very fresh. I mean, very, very clean, really, really fresh. I mean, like, you know, difficult to upgrade on Passata, but it's a great upgrade with it. That touch of saffron in there as well. Absolutely. So we're moving on from that one. I feel like I'm going through a shopping channel over here in your, your shop as well. <laughs> but I used to have a deli because I, I, I loved it. It was one of the most amazing times of my life. I had a little deli down the road. But uh, this one over here, we got a little bit of aubergine. And one of the things that I did find fascinating about the deli was taking produce from the likes of yourselves, Zoe, and just be enthused about as much as you are about producing it, selling it on. But this is, a, this is a little bit of aubergine. So tell us about this one. So this is a smoky aubergine dip, and it's got a very light smoke so that, you know, it doesn't overpower the flavour of the vegetables that are in there. Um, it's actually one of the things that I enjoy seeing people's face change when they try it. Um, what do you think of it? It's changing. His face has oh, changed. I love aubergine, but this is like slightly smoky, and uh, I don't know, it's beautiful flavour. Lovely, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you so much. So, so do you, how do you how do you get the aubergines to taste like that? Do you char grill them? How how does that work? Yeah, so you char grill them um, and make sure that you've you know so they don't explode in the in the on the grill. <laughs> you pierce them first, um, but there's also other vegetables in there and garlic, and it just is amazing. If you go on a picnic, all you need is a teaspoon, a jar, and some crackers, and away you go. Delicious. And your tipple of choice. So I've just got a little bit of kale over here. Just going to kind of recap what I've got here. Just a bit of kale. I'm going to use some of these. And if you think about Greece and Crete, you can't talk about that without dried herbs over here. And you've got 
an amazing selection as well. A little bit of oregano mm. and a little bit of thyme. But, but interestingly enough, when you're out in that neck of the woods, the, the, the thyme looks very, very different to our sort of UK thyme, doesn't it? It's just a, it's different, very floral. It is, yeah, yeah. Um, and I also have an amazing honey from the north of Greece. Um, so I, I work with small family producers from all over Greece, and the honey from the north is from bees that actually harvest the thyme flower, so the thyme comes through in the flavour of the honey. And I'm assuming it's the perfect thing for you because you get to go back on holiday, back to a place where you love. You can go, you can cherry pick the suppliers of where you want to supply and then bring it all back. It's, it's not a bad yeah. life, this show, is it? It's not bad. No, I'm not complaining at all. <laughs> it's probably a better choice than working in a restaurant, I think. Another job, yeah. I might go with you in the next trip. Exactly. So, <laughs> so You're just, welcome anytime. I've just used a selection of your bits and pieces. And what I've got in here is the, it's got the lamb. And then what you do with this is you just take this glaze. This, this is this mixture of, of your olives and your stock syrup. And you just glaze it over the top. If you don't cook with the glaze. Don't cook, cook with it. Like and what we're going to do is just yeah. flash it just behind me, just yeah. in the oven, just to, just to cool it up a little bit. But this gives this amazing sort of umami flavour with it as well. So you're just going to take that and just flash it in there. And while that's happening, a little pail is on here. So just before we let you go and back to your back to your lovely business, give us an idea of where people can get more information about your produce from. Then, where can people find out more? So you can buy directly online uh, on my web shop, and I do uh, cooking workshops in Bath. So if anybody's up for learning to do some Greek dishes with me, um, I can let you know if you, you sign up to, to my the... school. You could spend a weekend. Come to my school. <laughs> You could spend a weekend. You could do a little bit of Greek, a little bit of French as well while you're at it. I do the bread, you do the, the rest. Exactly. <laughs> That's the deal. <laughs> well, I wish you all the very, very best of luck with it. I, I don't, I, hopefully I've done it justice, justice because I, I love this sort of produce as well, but you, you take the little lamb chops over the top like that. It's so easy, isn't it? You just open the jar. I mean, so the flavor. I mean, that's it. You've got. I mean, I've used some of the passata. I've used some of the aubergine that's gone underneath as well. This is a little bit of yogurt in there as well. We're going to take a few of these dried herbs. I use the little bit of thyme on this one. The thyme is like slightly sweet. It's amazing. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. And then a good glug of the olive oil. So there we have it. Hopefully, I've done it justice. A little ray of sunshine from Hampshire to you in Bath. Thank right. you so much, James. Wonderful. It's a pleasure. Best of luck with it. And thank you for coming on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Best of luck with everything. Thanks. So there we have it. My finished dish, a little bit of Hampshire. Over to you in Bath. Yay! Is it Bath or Bath? Bath. Oh, no, it's Bath. It's definitely Bath. <laughs> it's definitely Bath. Perfect dish for you, Chief. Just big enough. <laughs> Hello, crew. <laughs> exactly. Bon appetit. So tell, tell me wow. what you think with the lamb, because I'm intrigued to know... I'm very intrigued by that. I think it's a and genius this, idea. And this comes from a Frenchman who taught me how to do this yeah. as well. I, I mm. think... I think... Honestly, it's a, it's a genius idea. It doesn't work with... Without the stock syrup, it just gives a lovely sweetness to it, but I think it's a genius idea. Beautiful fat on this lamb as well. Yeah, nice bit of fat on the lamb. But... Mm. Mm -mm -mm. None for you. That's Ralph, <laughs> sorry, by the way. There you go. Happy with that? Mm. It's nice, isn't it? And you're going to be cooking for us a little bit later. Remind us what you're going to do these puffball things. They look magic puffball. They look amazing as well. <laughs> and I'll be catching up with my mate Denise Van Elton and Blues Duncan James very shortly. But don't go anywhere, because after the break, we're heading down to the veg patch for some classic one pot cookery. I'll see you in a minute. Ralph, give it up. Welcome back. Now, there's a mass class in custard or crumb and glaze coming your way later. And I'll be cooking for Denise Van Olten and Duncan James from Blue very shortly. 
But before that, loads of you have been getting in touch on email and social media with photographs and videos of dishes you've been cooking at home. So I thought we'd take a look at just a few of them. First up this week, a big well done goes to Elizabeth Midgley, who was inspired by my Spanish adventure series to make this dish of seared yellowfin tuna. How good does that look frying away in the pan? Nothing beats that with just a little squeeze of lemon. Beautiful. Next up, Cecilia Chingwara has been making a dish of oxtail with rice. She says it's proper African comfort food. Look at that, oxtail, I love it. It requires a decent amount of time cooking, but it's worth it in the end. And finally, top marks this week goes to Emma Fairclough from Clanfield in Hampshire, who made the Swiss roll I did in a masterclass a few weeks ago. And check out her dogs, Alfie and Barney, waiting for any leftovers. I reckon the dog on the right may not get to leftovers. I think you'll probably get demolished if you turn your back. How good does that look? Brilliant. OK, it's time now for another recipe. And this week, we delve into the archives and heading down to the veg patch, which is just down there, to enjoy a delicious one-pot dish of seafood. Enjoy this one. Now this is a great one pot fish and shellfish dish that you can do on a barbecue like I'm gonna do, or on a, in a pan, or on the stove or in the oven, it's entirely up to you. It's kind of, you just put everything in and you don't need anything else to go with it. No, no garnish, no side orders, nothing. It's just the ultimate one pot. So running through the ingredients for this one, I've got some beautiful shellfish and fish over here. I've got some beautiful salmon. The crab that I've got, these are raw crab claws, but they're frozen, so they need cooking. Then I've got some clams, some prawns, some mussels, but it's entirely up to you what selection of fish and shellfish that goes in here. A bit of garlic, some fresh tomatoes, some tinned tomatoes, star anise, and some parsley. But the first thing we're going to do is get on and cook the garlic. Now, you need plenty of oil in the pan. The thing about this, you want a pan big enough to cook everything in. You don't want to be cooking it in separate pans, so a decent-sized pan. Take the garlic and we cut that straight in half like that. And all I'm going to do is just take the garlic pop it straight into the pan and just allow that to cook gently for about three or four minutes. Meanwhile, we'll prepare our crab claws. And for that, all you want really is a proper hammer. You can have a fancy, there's loads of gadgets you can buy online, anything like that, but a hammer is the best way to do it. A bit of weight behind it, just give it a quick tap just to break it so it makes it easier when they're cooked. So just crack them with a hammer. Now, you're not whacking it to bits. You want to keep the flesh in there as well intact. So you're just basically breaking the claw and the shell on the outside. And make sure you do it in all three places. That bit, as well as the end. OK, so when your garlic is nicely flavouring that oil, this is where we can add other spices. And the spice of choice, I think, for this one is a little bit of star anise. You can get powdered star anise. I find the best way to use star anise, because it's quite strong, is to use the whole spice, like that. And you can put in three or four will be enough for this, but they're beautiful whole spices. So often with dried, you always add not enough or too much, and generally it can burn, which means that it tastes like burnt spice in the pan as well. So you're starting to get that flavour going there, and then we can start to literally load in our shellfish and fish, so the crab claws can go in, like that. In there, all that lovely garlic and everything else. So once you've got the crab claws in, we can then think about the rest of the ingredients. I've got some beautiful prawns here. I've got some nice mussels. They can all go in. You're really loading this with shellfish and fish in there. And clams are always a good one, because there's plenty of liquid in this. That'll give you a wonderful sauce at the end of it as well. So load it all in. So once your shellfish is in, then we've got to think about a sauce part of this. And this is where a good quality white wine, just pop that in. And then for the sauce for this, you can use a passata, but what I love, are these. 
and I love them so much, I actually grow herbs in the leftover tins. These are San Marzano tomatoes, the classic tomato, the weapon of choice if you're going to make a pizza. This is what you use. Lovely and sweet, hardly any seeds. These have just been blended. I actually grow them in the greenhouse there, but they make an amazing sauce. And because they're lovely and sweet, you don't need to add anything like sugar and bits and pieces to it. So what I'm going to do is use some of this as the sauce. Like that. And then finally, just a few things. Some salt, of course, because the whole idea of this, once you lift off the cover, you don't need to do anything other than serve it. So get your seasoning in now. Black pepper, a good glug of oil. Like that. And then I'm going to top it with some nice pieces of salmon. You just sort of pop them in and around the edge. If you're unsure about the amount, a little bit more of this over the top. Now, it looks nothing now, but trust me, in about 10 minutes, this will be spectacular. Cover it over with a little bit of tin foil, and then just leave it. Leave it on the stove 10, 15 minutes, on the barbecue the same, or just pop it in the oven for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then all you've got to do is finish it off with just a touch of chopped parsley. Now, what I have got in the greenhouse, just to show you, I've been growing these and using these tomatoes for quite a while. Labels change colour a bit, but I grow chives and stuff like that in it. Now, you can use the chives for this. I'm going to use a bit of parsley. You can use both if you want, really, but just chopped parsley. So, chopped parsley. Now, you can use a combination of parsley and chives, but these are great in pots like this, just so you can grow it. And that the key to this is almost don't bother looking at it until you take it to the table. Take, take it to the table with a little pot of parsley and a little drizzle of olive oil, handy, but then take it to the table like this. Pop it in the middle. Because I said to you, this is one of those dishes, you don't need anything. You don't need potatoes with it. Sure, you can have a bit of bread, something like that. That's all you want with it, but when you lift this off... Look at that! A little bit of parsley over the top. And a nice drizzle of olive oil. What more do you want? All on a barbecue. Simple, but it's all about the quality of the ingredients. Those tin tomatoes, a little bit of star anise, and don't forget that amazing selection of seafood. Look at these. Gorgeous. It's good, that, isn't it? A great dish there, and I love to cook that at the bottom of the garden any time of the year. Right, I'll be showing you the right way to make custard or crumb and glaze in this week's Little Masterclass. That's coming up a little bit later. And I'll see you back here after the break when I'll be joined in the house by my old friend Denise Van Olten and blue star Duncan James will be here. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, coming up, Knox Majorsi will be teaching us all about the ultimate pork pie, and Richard Bertonet will be making his bread puff ball. That's coming up next. It looks amazing, both of those dishes. But first, I'm here with two best friends who conquered the charts and the West End stage before finally teeing up in the recording studio. It's Denise Milan and Duncan James! <laughs> Great to have you on the show. Ching, ching, ching. I've got my glass over here. Oh, here, here ching, we go. Ching, Cheers. Ching, ching. There ching. we go. It's so nice Cheers. to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Well, good to see you again. I'm always here, you know. Good, well, exactly. Your, your mate comes here a lot. No, I feel, I feel left out. Well, a lot, to be honest with you. <laughs> I mean, I'm literally a part of the family. Uh, you are now officially our most invited and uninvited guest that keeps coming back. <laughs> 
I do. I gave Duncan a tour of the house, your house, exactly. because I know it so I thought, well. I thought I was selling it, to be honest. I walked into it. <laughs> yeah, it's through a state agent walking around. But anyway, so you're here again. So we, for your first time, I it thought is. I'd do you a, a little gluten-free dish. So we've got gluten-free okay. flour. We're going to do salt and pepper squid, because I know oh, you love your chilli squid. Favorite. So this, this is a, like a, a, a red pepper tomato chilli jam. We've got red peppers, onions. We've got a little bit of lemongrass over here, some garlic, a little bit of chilli, brown sugar, tin tomatoes, and then vinegar. And the idea is we just blend it all together together and cook it and it makes the most amazing chili jam. Now we're going to talk about you both a little bit uh, later about what you're doing as well but first of all Duncan you, to do a career like yours it was almost instant though wasn't it in terms of music you, you were yeah. brought together as a band and it was bang not just bang just just in the UK it was internationally yeah, it was crazy. I mean, to be fair, we didn't really know what was going on at the time. We were <laughs> young. I mean, Lee was 17, bless him. I mean, he was a baby. I was 22, and it literally happened overnight. I just remember we went into um, a place called Trondheim in, in Norway, in the north of Norway, and we recorded some songs with these producers, and we didn't really know what was going to happen, really. And I remember we came back to the record label, and they, like we found this song that you've done called All Rise. We want it to be the first single. And I've been thinking to the boys, All Rise, it, when we recorded it, it was like, we didn't really like it. And they were like, listen to this. And they played it to us and it had this harmonica on the beginning and they completely flipped the song on its head for yeah. what we did when we recorded it and became the song that you know today. And literally that song went round the world top 10. It was amazing. Do you, I, do you miss it all? Or? I don't actually remember anything from back then. I <laughs> <laughs> don't remember nothing. But you say that you, it's, in a, it's not anticipated, but to, was, it, was it what you wanted? Is it what... Because when you ask anybody in the music business, as you know, even in it as well, you, you, you want it, and then when you're actually in it, you just think, this is just... I mean, it's, it's actually quite a brutal industry to be in, isn't it, really? It's yeah. quite cutthroat. I, I was living in a bubble for about two years. I remember just... It was literally like being in a bubble. Didn't know what was going on. We were on a plane every day, and... It was madness. And then came the kind of, you know, the press attention and the media, and you realise that you actually can't do anything. You don't have a normal life anymore. It's, it was really, really quite scary at that point. I mean, we used to have paparazzis camping outside our house every day, and it was like the intrusion of all of that and, and your kind of normality of life just goes out the window and you become, like, almost public property. So that was quite hard all of a sudden. I think it was hard for, like, my mum and stuff to deal with because, you know, my mum would want to take me out to a restaurant or, you know, just do something normal with me. And then it was, like, people coming up all the time and it was like, Especially we can't do you, it. Especially you, because you're the hunk of the band, let's <laughs> face it, the one that everybody fancied. Because it's very... It's, it's different in terms of, well, you, you were training because it was the theatre, you know, acting was once what you wanted as well. But you managed to do a different cross-section, a bit of everything. I remember... Yeah. Big breakfast when I think we first met. Probably when you first yeah. met. That's how we first yeah. met. Yeah, I think I was on the bed. We met you on a bed, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> with the boys. <laughs> but yeah, but you know what's funny actually? We've talked about this because we've had quite similar careers in as much as we both do a bit of everything. Like we've both done radio, haven't we? We've mm. done theatre, we've done a bit of acting, presenting, together. presenting, performing. So, you know, so it's kind of like we have quite similar careers. But is it difficult to be taken seriously when you, when you put you know, yourself in the terms of the, your band? I mean, you're going to go look at Harry Styles and the acting and that kind of thing. It's quite difficult for you to do, but you managed to do a bit of both, really, because, you know, you, but you, you, if you, your, your, your theatre side of things seems to be what you really, really love. Like the music for you, but the theatre is... Would it be right thinking it's... Yeah. It's what you love more than anything? I think it's anything live. I like a live yeah. performance. So even if I'm doing TV, live TV, I buzz, you know, when I'm doing live telly. But you're the same, aren't you, I think? Because we've done, we've done shows where our paths have crossed. We've not performed together, but I did Chicago, Dunk did Chicago, Legally Blonde, we've yeah. both done. Yeah. Well, so Because you, you both did it, you're not together, you just did it at different times. Yeah. Yeah. But, but tell us what you're up to now, then, because now you, you're back music together. This is for an amazing cause as well, really, but it, that was the thing that came sort of secondary to that you were in the studio... Yeah. Tell, so, us about, tell us about it, because we've got a little clip that we're going to play in a second. But. Oh, so it's lovely. So I've been recording an album, which will be out next spring, yeah. and I wanted to put a duet on the album. And I've, the, basically, the album that I've recorded is the soundtrack to my life, because the last time I came on, my autobiography had just come out. It had, yeah. Um, so I wanted to then put the music that would go with my autobiography, so all the songs that have influenced my life or are relevant to a certain time in my life. And 
earlier this year, there was the passing of Burke Bacharach. I've always loved Bacharach music, so wanted to do a cover of That's What Friends Are For, because I just love the song. I think it's a lovely song. The lyrics are amazing. The music's obviously incredible. And obviously, Duncan and I, we've known each other for so many years, it, and we do goggle box together, of course. So yeah. I was just like, it's got to be Duncan. You know, he's the only person I can do it with. <laughs> so, and, yeah, and so this... it's nice. We've never recorded together, no. so it's lovely. It's the first time we've well, well, this is the end result. If you haven't heard it already, check, check this out as well. Shove off. <laughs> <laughs> what a voice, yeah. still. What oh, voice. Dung's voice. I know, and I say this every time we do an interview for something, and I'm just like, his voice, your voice is so incredible. And I think that's the thing as well, when you're in a band, sometimes people don't get to hear just how brilliant you are, you know, because there's all four different voices going on. But, but you have, you know, you were in Chicago, you have, it, it, listening to you, you've got a voice for that West End yeah, performance I, as well. I, I kind of always, I've, for, for me, I've always loved musical theatre, and I think. <laughs> Blue was amazing for me because it opened the door to so many different opportunities and so many different avenues that I could go down. And, and, and in a way, that's kind of why me and Denise connected so well, because we both had a love of doing musical theatre. Um, and as you said, we kind of both followed the same path, didn't we? Like with Chicago and everything. So yeah, for me, I love it. I love singing like that. And we've both worn fishnet tights. We both love a fishnet tie. Because I have worn fishnets in the cabaret show, a proud cabaret. Dunk was in Proud Cabaret wearing fishnet ties in pair drag. Of fishnets, yeah. So we love a pair of fishnets <laughs> and high heels. <laughs> it's a match right. made in heaven. Well, I'm just going to recap what we've got in here. So we've got a look. We've got we pureed all the veg. Because I saw you watching. We pureed all the veg that we've got in here. In we go with the tintamars. That's going to go in there as well. Ooh. Then we put some brown sugar in. And then we put some red wine vinegar in. And you cook this down for about half an hour and you end up with this. Chili jam. Amazing. It is amazing. Absolutely amazing. So just to go back on the single as well, just so the reason we wanted to do Well, this is what I want to say, because this is it's yeah. got a it's got a it's a cause that is close to so many people's hearts. So yeah. many people. Mine included, as everybody, there'll be lots of people watching in, touched by by well, the, the charity that you're doing it for as well. Tell us. Yeah, so it's the Macmillan Cancer Trust, and Dunk and I have both got personal experiences of being helped by the Macmillan nurses and supported. They looked after both my grandparents when they were passing and were just incredible to the family. We've been to visit yeah. a couple of their centres. And actually, when you go, even more so, it hits home of what they actually do for people and the support that they give people, um, which is why we wanted to do this. And they've just been so been amazing. amazing. And this, they appreciate it so much as well that it makes it all the more special. Well, Island. good luck with it as well, because I know you're going to stick around uh, for the rest of the morning. I know Denise is sticking around this evening, tomorrow. <laughs> and that, <laughs> and next that. week. There's, there's a wall that needs painting outside if you do that as well while you're here. Uh, <laughs> We're going to then... I'm going to finish this off, cos uh, we've got our... This is our chilli jam, so what you want to do is just... We just warm this up a little bit. So just warm this up. As soon as you've got it cooked, you can allow this to go cold if you want. But you just warm it up a touch in the pan, like that. And we just put a little bit of this chilli jam. So the squid, you can see, I've just simply, simply cooked. Very, very hot oil is what you want. Really? How and do you I get the batter to stick to it so easily then. What you do you make do? it a little bit more liquid than people think? Right. People don't make the batter, they make it too thick. Right. And do it too thick, it does the opposite things. It can fall off, but also it goes really uh, chewy and it's, right. it's not, not properly cooked. He wants it nice and crisp. Mm. So what's the secret then? How do you do it? Thin. But gluten free flour. Right. It's gluten free self raising flour. Yeah. Pinch of salt. I put some crushed black pepper in there. Yeah. And just some fizzy cider. Fizzy just cider. cider, yeah. Don't use sparkling water. Cider, really? and it, it tastes amazing. Wow. And then what you can then do is take some cream, so just a touch of cream, and then a little bit of lime, 
like that. Mm. And then you can then take some lime juice in here and make sort of mm. like your own sour cream. Really. Nice. So good. you can see it sets, look. Wow. Straight away, that's just lime juice. And you just put a few, it's just like, like your own creme fraiche, really. Yeah. So, but you Just get, a couple of dollops. Oh, you get, get amazing flavour from it. <laughs> just a few dollops just on it. Just a little dollop. And then look, you take this squid. Oh, oh. And you just, it's crunchy. The great thing about this batter as well, when you're doing this, it will actually hold. It's nice to see gluten-free batter as well. Yeah, isn't it? yeah. I've I mean, got a couple of friends like yourself who, who can't have gluten, so it's good. It's to got to be self-raising flour. Yeah. That's the thing, gluten-free self-raising flour. But it works a treat. Take a little bit of chilli, just some fresh chilli over the top. A few sprinkles of that, a few sprinkles of that. A little bit of coriander over the top. And then a nice little squeeze of lime, or a little wedge of lime, to go with it. So there you have it, my salt and pepper squid. Ooh. I guess a round of Bravo. applause. <laughs> Bon appétit. Yes. Oh, thank you. Ooh. There you go. Wow. This looks <laughs> incredible. Tell me what you think of that one. So I wouldn't normally use a knife and a fork. I'm normally like, You're I think... You're going with your hands. I normally, yeah, do you know do what? Do you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I am. No, I'm, I'm going to be very lazy-like for a change. The jam and everything else. I'm always getting told off. Oh. oh. It's so light. It... That is delicious. Mm. Right? Yeah. So good. It's good. We're going to stick around. You're going to stick around all morning. We'll chat yeah. a little bit more later as well. Brilliant. Uh, there we go. We'll be more from Denise and Duncan a little bit later. And uh, Vinette Robinson will be here from the hit new drama, Boiling Point. She'll be dropping by the house very shortly. But join us again after the break when we've got more top quality bacon from the legendary baker, Mr Richard Burton. The ovens are turned up. You've got bread puff balls. Wait till you see this. See you after the break. Welcome back. Now, Vinette Robinson we're from the new drama Boiling Point will be dropping by shortly, and I'll be showcasing how to make the ultimate custard in this week's Little Masters. But first, I'm joined by the house by Knox Majorsi. Good to have you back. Thank you. Now, the last time you were here, you made this amazing sort of big Wellington, that kind of stuff. What, what you, you, uh, try your hand at pork pie, this one. Yeah, this time I'm going to be doing the pork pie. Yeah, and it's, this has proved really, really popular at your place, isn't it, really? Yeah, it's very popular and uh, handmade as well, so it's quite a classic uh, dish that I'm going to be doing, so I'm well, excited. You, you may need the hand of one, a certain certain person to my left as well over here, uh, because we're about to get a master of our very own from one of the best bakers in the business. He really is a true mate of the show. It's Mr. Richard Bertinay! Thank you, thank you. Wonder to have you back, Chef. Uh, so, a pleasure. The, these are quite... Now, Knox was looking at this going, what on earth is this? <laughs> We're all looking at this going, what on earth is this? What on earth is it? I'd be foraging. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the magic puff ball. The magic puff ball. Yeah. And this is just a, a, a bread dough? Just basic plain dough. The idea is to reverse a salad. So instead of the crouton in your salad, we yeah. put the crouton on the outside. OK. So the salad's yes, going to be inside. Exactly. Got it. All right, right. Okay. so first of all, how I'm so, going to be preparing the little salad and the dressing and everything else. How, yeah. how so, do you make this, then? How are you going to so put it all my, together? I got my uh, Bessie white dough. She's made with a just strong bread flour and then uh, salt, um, fresh yeast, and also, look at this, some so, water. So you just, you just knock that up like this. Do you keep the machine going for a period of time? Or the machine, it's about four minutes on slow speed, and about, depending on what door hook you've got, uh, about five, six minutes on, the, on speed, medium speed. Uh, okay. But you just need a nice... Oh, wow. Nice, good door like that. And done. Tiny bit of flour yeah. on top. So we're doing, we're doing this with, like, a little Caesar salad that you want in there as well, so... Yeah, well, you can do any salad, but I saw the Caesar salad is quite um, uh, nice thing to, to do in there. Yeah. So, Put my dough to rest, and then I've made some. So is that le that's left to prove or left to rest? Left to rest. That's left to rest. Okay. Proving is after you shape it and so on. Okay. So you can see I've got the dough in half, so you got one and a half in here, and the dough yeah. is just nice and and bouncy. So 
Now, we've music. already been to a bath or bath or how bath, you pronounce yep. it on this show, but bath, bath. Where, bath where I come from. It's scone and scone, it's the same thing. It's a, just the same thing. It spells the same way. So exactly. <laughs> but you, 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 about five or six years ago, you saw the bakery. We saw it five years ago. Yeah. And now you've got, you've, you, so anybody wanted to come and see you and taste your sort of stuff, you've got the... the just a cooking school now. You're only so cooking school. I'm always hiding at the cooking school. So, the, yeah, the... We saw the, the shop in Bath and everything's got nothing to do with us anymore. Yeah. But, um, yeah, the school's still busy and busy and busy. We've got people, as somebody from the Falkland Island last week. So, it, 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 I'm always amazed how far people come to, to learn to, to bake with us. So, it's, uh, it's I, I feel very privileged for this. So, what I'm going to do is, you can use a scale if you want to, but yeah. the good thing to have different shape and so on. So, so in here, do you, want, do you want me to use some of this? Anchovy paste? Anchovy paste, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. I'm just going to roll my dough like this, and just a little ball, not too tight, just that. And you can see that I've made some square, some little pillows. Yeah. Out. So is the key to it not too tight because you don't know what it, this is, this is going to cause it to not Yeah, I mean, the dough will, will puff up anyway. It's because you can see there, all the air pockets, the dough is nice and light. Just so you can carry on, make a lot more if you want to. I'm going to take a little bit of water out of here. Yeah, make it well. nice and runny. That'd be great, thank you. Yeah, take a little bit. So in here, we've got some mayonnaise. I've got some parmesan, some lemon, some of the anchovy, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Some grated parmesan cheese as well. I'm going to make and this the nice and And the trick is to get your piece your of dough like this. Yeah. Place it on flour, both sides, and that's your top in here. And use a rolling pin and just roll it thin. So keep turning the dough over and over. You need a nice clean surface, no, no bits of dough or anything like that. You don't want to pierce right. through it. You can see the air pocket in there, yeah? Yeah. yeah. So what's up with the, when you go on a hot uh, tray inside, the air inside will expand. OK. So it's a bit like a pita bread, but you go a bit further, so you leave it to set in your... Right. So is the, is the, the, the thickness has got to be the quite important. You don't want it to be too thick. Yeah. The way, what you want is to be nice and, and um, even, that's the main thing. It's so. got to be even and flat, I take it, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And then you're going to put a pill like that. And it's a massive big pill there. So this is an upside-down tray that you've upside preheated in there. Yep. In a nice hot oven. I know you want to do another one as well. I'll do another one, just in case. And this is a, this is a hot oven, about 2.30. So yep. really hot. Yep. So you want a, a nice burst of heat going to it. So where did you and where did you fall in love? Obviously France, obviously you've got to talk about French and the bacon and everything else. But were you doing this as a kid? Or was... I think when you're in France, when you get up in the morning, you know, every day you go and buy your bread in a, in a bakery at the weekend. And I always remember when I was a kid to my local bakery. I remember one day the one of the baker opened the door of uh, where the oven was, and I could see that guy covered in flour That's... and his apron there. He had some pride out of it what he was doing. So all the customers could see him. Yeah. And uh, one day I found myself behind that door working. I remember the same pride I had when, you know, you felt like, uh, uh, I don't know, you felt part of something working in the bakery. And yeah. after that, I hated it because, you know, you got to work weekends or whatever, your mates go out and then <laughs> exactly. that. But uh, I it's think... Very, <laughs> I often find that there's very few jobs as rewarding as baking. I think it's, it's, it goes in your blood. I think it's like, you make, make, make good pie. You, you want it to make even more better and better and better. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you can't work in a bakery if you, if you hate it. I think it's just... Uh, but, you know, you, take, you, take, you take flour, water and yeast and there's not many people who can transform it into amazing things. You know, that, that takes years of practice, skill, and you make it look very, very easy. Uh, it's like any skill, you know? It's, if you look at somebody... I always <laughs> say, I had a plaster doing plastering in my house. I said, how much do I pay you? He says, this much. I said, I can do it myself. I tried. No. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do the DIY. Yeah. So, you know, when you look at somebody who's been doing it for years, and it always looks easy. Yeah, um, you make it look easy. So, so Right, so we've got in here, we've got our, so your, your little Caesar salad. You've got some... OK, so I'm going to put one up together for you. So this is where we're going to build something up. Yep. You'll see these cooking as, as they are in there as well. I'll do some of your nice little bit of... Yeah, some uh, shaving parmesan. I'll so we've got some... Uh, Nice jam lettuce in here. Yeah. Uh, some anchovies, if you like them, of course. Some chicken and some parmesan coming up. And a There's a little bit of parmesan in there. Yes. Yeah. Gorgeous, gorgeous. So, get the purple. Need a present for you. I love these. I love these. <laughs> so, That's good. Let me get my hand a bit. So precise. 
They're great, aren't they? Yeah, really. So I'll just season this up with a little bit of salt and pepper. So if you're the bread roll with no crumb inside, you can use a cutter, grand cutter, square cutter, and do a lot of little ones. So you end up with something very different on the bread basket. But the key to that is just the hot tray, that's all you do. Yeah, hot, uh, good dough first, OK? If you make right. good dough, yeah. then your bread will be fine after that. So that's my puff board in here. The super light. Turn it over. Can I bore you on it? Yeah, so what do you want? I'm going to nick this one, it's nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then just... I can see people trying to do this weekend and it's not happening. <laughs> it's not happening and they're going to be shouting at you on you TV. I know. It's Monday funny. morning, they're going to be booking your class going, how, the <laughs> how on earth did you do that? The thing is practice, and if you want five good um, bowls, you, you might need to do a few more. You know, it's a, it's a, So the trick is to build them upside down, so not this way, but like this. So when you open it, hopefully the leaf will come the right way around. And then you alternate your chicken. Ah, so you're building a picture the opposite way around. Exactly. And no dressing. Interesting you put the dressing on afterwards when you break the it Probably up. if you do them in advance, if you put the dressing too early, then you will suck through the, the crust. Yeah. So I think it's quite nice. Also, sometimes, the sear side can be overdressed, so you can just choose how much dressing you want on yours as well. Yeah. So, um, can we have a quick peep in there? Cross fingers. Okay. Have a quick look while you're in it. Yep. What, so you got one, one moment? The first one you didn't puff, the second one is better, so. Done. There you go. That's all you Oh, wow. So, leave those in there. Yeah. So, yeah. you have to make a few of them to make sure one of them. Yeah, but yeah. It's, when I first came up with the idea, I'd, it was by, me, by mistake, back when you know, you come up. So, Ooh, I like that. Right. <laughs> so uh, and that was one of the first things I did in my, my first book yeah. 18 years ago. So um, it was good fun. So there's one there. Have you got a plate somewhere, James? Yeah, there's, there's a plate there. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll serve, serve, serve that one on the board. Yeah. I'll put that one there, and then you can serve this one on, on this here board over here. Make a mess on your board. Here we go. And I'll let you oh, crack wow. one, and I'll let you finish it off, and I'll, I'll leave Knox to crack that one. So that, there you go. You can you I can then this finish this off with the dressing and everything else. You sure you don't want to do it? You're very jealous. No, you've got that one as well. Knox has got oh, that that's one. True. But... OK. Yeah. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. So if you've got the plate, of course, everything stay there. Yeah. There's your dressing. There. It looks so one. good, though, doesn't it? Yeah. This is... Incredible. People are going to love to make this. This is ace. I love this. But I see, imagine on a dinner table, you got a puff ball out, what the hell, and bang, 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 or everybody. So I see it's quite I good. I love it. It's quite good fun. Power's on as well? Yeah, come on, bang something. Over the top. You have black pepper as well, just for the look. I will get that, no problem. Black pepper is behind me, there you go. So give us the name of this dish. Magic puff ball with Caesar salad. <laughs> Richard Burson, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Right there, Knox, there you go. You can open that up and I'll dress it for you. <laughs> Meanwhile, you're, you're going to take the one that's in the... Another so you, people can see which, which, which you've got in here. So. The, good, the good and the bad. So one's worked, but you can... You can go on, give it a whack. Yeah. One, one's worked and one hasn't, but you can still use that. Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, it's the best crouton. Oh, you know. Yeah. Come on, go for it. There you go. Can't be shy okay. with this. Well, you've got your knife and fork. There's your dressing. Bits and pieces, a little bit of Parmesan cheese over the top. Pepper if you want, let's go. A little bit of black pepper. Bon appétit. How's that? Amazing. And the taste of that is just... I'm excited. It's great though, isn't it? I think, I think people will try this, because I think it's just... Look, they it's look worth, spectacular. It's worth trying, yeah. And with the same dough, you can make some little fugas, you make some little tin loaf. Yeah. So it just... It just it's not a dough just for the purple, you can do different things with it. So uh, is this like a pizza bread dough? Or is this totally it's just different? basic white dough. I make pizza with that dough, I make all sorts. Okay. So if you master that dough, you can just play with it. Right, there so. you go. There you go. Richard Burson, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Happy with that? Yeah. That's going on a restaurant menu near you very soon, <laughs> I think. There we go. Uh, right, Knox will be treating us to her version of pork pies a little bit later, award-winning pork pies, and we're giving you a little masterclass in crumb and glaze or custard very shortly. But join us again after the break, where I'll be cooking for Boiling Point star Vinette Robinson. I'll see you in a bit.
Welcome back. Now, this week's Masterclass is all about custard or creme anglaise, and we've got more fantastic food on the way from Chef Knox Majorsi a little bit later on this morning. But first, I'm here with an actress who has appeared in Star Wars, Sherlock, Doctor Who. It is like a who's who of your career already <laughs> before landing a star role as a chef in the hit new drama, Boiling Point. It's Bernard Robinson! Yay! Great to have you on the show as well. And, and uh, out of all the things you've done, I'm sure you get asked all this, but from chefs particularly, going, wow, what, what, that was so realistic in terms of what it was. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But as a foodie, are you a big foodie or...? I love to eat. You love to eat? Uh, yeah, OK, so I, I thought what we're going to do for you... So I thought I'm going to do uh, this little ceviche, little sort of... We've got some beautiful bit of sea bass over here. Uh, we're not far from the coast. I've got some lovely salmon. And I'm going to do this hot sesame dish. So it's serve hot sesame and then you make a little little dressing, little cream dressing to go with it. So it all starts off with a beautiful piece of salmon and a lovely little bit of sea bass. And all I'm going to do is just take a fillet knife and just cut a nice little piece out of it, starting with that, and then we're going to cut little slices out of it like this and just lift these out. So nice and carefully like that. So before we talk about boiling point, because I can't wait to talk about that, we're going to talk about your earlier career at a Bradford Lass. I am. Bradford Lass. So were you, were you always that at school? Were you always uh, wanting to be a, an actress? Was that, was that always on the cards for you? Was it, was it family? What, what was the turning... What was the...? the uh, yeah, no, it wasn't. I, I don't... <laughs> it wasn't at all. Like, where I came from, it wouldn't have even been a consideration or in the consciousness. I just... It was an English class at school. Um, we were doing poetry. A teacher... Uh, I was doing a dramatised poem with a friend and a yeah. teacher thought it was good enough to enter into a local speech and drama festival. Right. And then I got on that stage. <laughs> couldn't get you off. I couldn't get me off. <laughs> and that was, I was 13. And, um, I really, just... that's, that was the hook? That yeah, was... it really was. Right. I don't know what that says about me, with, you know, the applause and the attention or, or what. Well, but... I mean, you've done not so bad from it <laughs> since then as well, really. And, and going on from that, really, you've managed to do so many different things in... I've got to say, what is a short career in terms of what you've done? Because you're not old, old, and you just... <laughs> not old, old. No, you're not, old. but you're not. You're not at all. And <laughs> what, you, what you've done in that, um, that amazing career, you've managed to balance film and, and, and television, and, and now you're back into television. So t I've got to say that, that, that this boiling point. So anybody that hasn't seen it, tell us about the film, first of all, because uh, it's quite unique in terms of how it was shot. Yeah, so it was uh, done in one take, set over the night, uh, one night in a restaurant, um, following the head chef, Andy Jones, played by Stephen Graham, and various things go wrong, but it, it sort of finds him at a point of crisis in his life, I guess. And which so is, which is, I mean, it's a touching thing, because, I, I mean, I remember watching it, I've watched it again and again and again, and there are so many elements as a chef and, and, and working in the restaurant business that you sort of pick up on and go, that happened, that happened, that happened. There's not many that are realistic. I know Bradley Cooper did a thing, but that's not the realistic. <laughs> but this is... If you want to watch something that's so realistic, and so realistic, because that's now taken on as a, as a TV drama. Now you're yeah. then pursuing this, which you always want to know about the, the other people in it, not from just the main characters, but the people like yourself that you played, you want to know more about it. This then takes you on a journey beyond that. Yeah, I think that was one of the lovely responses to the film that people um, really like the little windows into the other characters in the restaurant um, to, to those characters and their lives and you just got little glimpses and people wanted to know more. So in the series, over four episodes, we get more of a chance to do that. So, um, you know, uh, they, they talk about it as uh, a slice of life into yeah. these little windows. And because a restaurant in London allows the people who work in it to come from all different walks of life. It allows you to tell, like, various different stories. The spin-off stories from it yeah. as well. Yeah. Did you... Did, I mean, you trained in a restaurant, not... You, you ended up working in a restaurant quite young, didn't you? And then just left after... Oh, was no. it one shift? <laughs> no, no. I, when I uh, was a drama school <laughs> student, um, I went and did uh, a trial shift. We won't mention the restaurant. No, no, but, yeah. I know, I know. Uh, at uh, a well-known chain. Right. Uh, and... Yeah, I think the, the customers were so rude. <laughs> I just was like, this is not for This, so this is not, is not for, for you. And left before the shift ended. That's, that's, yeah. that's it. So did you end up working in a restaurant for, to get into some research on this? Because it fascinates me how real is it? But you didn't actually work in restaurants for a long time. You know, no, it? I would have loved 
to, but I just didn't have the time because I was shooting another series right up until the point I was shooting this TV series. So I shadowed um, a brilliant chef called Pip Lacey. She's not bad. She comes in, comes in the house quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a bad person to shadow as well. Well, it's brilliant also for me. I particularly wanted to shadow a woman yeah. um, because I know that, like, their path through the industry, it, you know, can be really tough. Yeah. Everybody's path through this industry can be tough because it's a competitive and tough industry. But um, she was brilliant. So I spent... Uh, a day with her and she was very happy to talk me through her journey and how she'd come up as a chef and um I did a trial shift at uh one of her restaurants yeah um so it was just really interesting to watch her work and it's watch quite her fascinating, lead a team. Isn't it? when she, when when somebody's never seen it before it's quite fascinating to see something like that that I kind of take for granted really you go back in the kitchen but people from the outside go it's complete it's like an orchestra going yeah on. yeah the precision and and I just, I don't know how you guys do it. I don't know how you do it, to be honest with you. <laughs> We're going to see how you do it in a minute, but because first of all, I'm just going to make a little bit of mayonnaise. I've sliced my fish over here, a little bit of mayonnaise. We've got a touch of mustard, some egg yolks, and I'm going to slowly, slowly add the oil to make a nice little mayonnaise, which gives the cue to watch you in action, really. So this is a little bit, if, you, if you're not seeing Boiling Point, you have to see it. You have to see the film first and then follow it with a TV series, but just check this out. You guys really, really. talk crazy. Like Terrain. Thank you. Chef, this is Johnny. He's here for his first chef. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, nice introduction, Terrain. Oh, by the way, lad, thank you. Let him end the door. I really am sorry, there was just a lot of traffic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, 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 it's fine. Good. Sorry, yeah, OK, look, we're going to have to dive straight in because it's madness out there. Uh, I don't have time to do a full tour. So, quick intros. This is our incredible Sue Freeman. I'd be lost without him. Over here, we have the wonderful Camille on starters and garnish. Johnny. <laughs> Literal earth angel, Emily, head of pastry. All right, darling, how are you doing? Yep, not many, right. And one of our rising stars of the kitchen, Jamie, oh, WCDP. And here we have Scout, sorry, Bolton, meat and fish. Well, hang on, do I not get any like objectors now? Um, grumpy? Uh, handsome. Uh, debatable. Talented. Mm, hairy. Pro <laughs> <laughs> I'll go along with that one. Yay! There we go. So, I mean, it is fantastic to watch. It really, really is. And, and credit to you as well. But you're doing so much other things that you've been doing as well. Then I was reading all about you last, last night. I didn't realise you'd been doing Star Wars. I had a small part well, in you, Star yeah, Wars. Yeah, but that's... <laughs> but it was quite an interesting fact is you, you went for the part... Or you went for a part. Was it Natalie Portman took, you took your part, wasn't She it? took my part. She took your part. How dare she? <laughs> no, no, it was my first ever audition when I was 13. Right. I mean, I had no clue what I was doing. There is no way I was ever going to get that part, but... Yeah, it was it was the first audition I ever had. So there is something quite nice. What was about... that like doing that, really? Because oh, God, I didn't. I you know, it, I had no clue. I just sort of went. Was very nervous, and the casting director was really kind and just had a chat with me, and and that was it, and sent me on my way. You know, <laughs> she must have known as soon as I walked in that, you know, it wasn't going to happen. But um... but in terms of your job, really, I mean, failure is a bit like the chefing sort of thing. Mm. I don't know to come back to that, but but acting's the same sort of thing. You have to accept. Failure, and you have to accept that it's not that it's not not reflection of you, but it's refle it's like the customers, you know, yeah. when you're saying it's no reflection of you. It's the fact that the, it's just not right for you at that, you know, what says the director or producer. It's quite difficult to do that that yeah. rejection thing, particularly early on, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it. Yeah, you get better at dealing with it, but the amount of rejection is a lot, and for that not to close you down, for you to still say stay excited about what you're doing and. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky balance, but I guess the parallel that I found talking to chefs that I find with acting is it comes from such a place of passion. It's sort of in you. It's part of who you are. That yeah. like. So yeah. where do you where do you find? Because you're doing a lot of TV now. You're doing a lot of television. Mm. Where do you find that, that you still look? Because whenever I speak to anybody that that performs like yourself. The West End and the theatre is all what you love, because you love Shakespeare. It's a bit different to, to, to uh, Star Wars and Boiling yeah. Point and that kind of stuff. Do you hark back for that when you when you get offered a script for bits and pieces? Is that what you still aim to do? Or, I mean, I think the the ideal thing is to have a range yeah. uh, of different things, and so I don't sort of mind what medium it is as long as the like the material's interesting and the and the creative uh, team are interesting. Um, You're doing a bit of everything. Well, considering I, I remember we just we just spoke earlier before before you came into the house and you just said 
He's never, ever done an interview before. <laughs> Hopefully that was all right. Yeah. Was that all right? Yeah, you survived? Yeah, it was good. I survived. You survived? Yeah, yeah. I put the other questions, the more difficult questions underneath. I thought, <laughs> no, well, just do this one. But look, we just got in here a lovely little bit of chilli like that. It's been a pleasure having you at the house and great to see you as well because I'm a big fan, like you said, of all that you're doing, boiling point and everything else. And hopefully you like the food because it's a fair trip down here. But we take a little bit of chilli, a, a touch of... This is this sesame, so toasted sesame, just over the top. And we took the white and the dark, like that. It's very, very simple. The little, little cream dressing that we do, and we just take some coriander. And we just put that on the top. And there we have it. It's really, really simple, but super, super tasty, with a touch of salt over the top. And there we have it. Hopefully you enjoy it. This looks amazing. My nice little dish of sea bass and salmon. Done. Easy as that. <laughs> well, there you go. Dive into that. Thank you. There you go. Tell me what you think of that one, really. But it's just, it's, I love it, the creamy dressing and... It's amazing what, what, just several little bottles of bits mm. and pieces, lotions and potions, it packs so much of a punch. It's so good. It's good, isn't it? It's so good. But the creamy dressing with it and mm. everything else, it's just delicious. I expect to see that on a TV show soon, on the, on the, <laughs> menu, yeah. on the menu, as you're about to put it over the pass. There you yeah. go. But there you go. Vanette Robinson! Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Right, there's still lots more to come this morning, including the best pork pies in the business. Wait till you see these. And we've got some more from Denise Van Oden and Duncan James, and I'll see you a bit back here after the break. We've got a masterclass in creme anglaise that you don't want to miss. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, Chef Knox Majorsi will be showcasing her award-winning pork pies next, and I was serving up a second course for my guests at the end of the show. But first, it's time for this week's Little Masterclass. And this week, it's all about making custard or creme anglaise. So, first of all, what is it? Custard is a combination, or creme anglaise is a combination of egg yolks, sugar, and a liquid. Now, I say a liquid because most often it's done with milk, but you can enrich it, and you can enrich it in two ways. You can add cream, or part cream instead of milk, but also more egg yolks in there as well. The flavourings I'm going to get onto in a minute, but over this standard recipe I've got in here, 400 mils of cream, 400 mils of milk, and we're going to add that to a cold pan, first of all. So, traditionally this would be made with all milk, but I like to enrich it, so to flavour it even more. You can, if you want a really rich ice cream, which you can, this is used for the base of, use all cream if you want. It's entirely up to you, but that goes in there. Next, we're thinking about our flavourings into this as with this starts to warm up. And so often, classically, this is done with vanilla. We're going to use this vanilla over here, and what we do is we split the vanilla pod down the centre, like that. Now, if you are going to use one of these vanilla pods, you can utilise the entire thing, so nothing gets wasted. So we use the seeds, we get all those seeds out, and we can actually reuse the pod. Because even though we're going to put the pod in here and start to infuse the flavour of this, you can take the pod out, you can just dry that out a little bit, just leave it out overnight, it'll dry out, and then we can add that to sugar. If you just blend that with some caster sugar, you've got vanilla sugar you can use for tea and coffee, that kind of stuff. Or this, you can then turn it into a... just put it into a, a jar of sugar and it'll flavour the sugar over a few months. It's absolutely delicious. So you can utilise the entire thing of it. So what you want to do now is just gently warm this up. I say gently warm it up. We want to gently warm it up because we don't want to burn the milk or the cream. So now we're on about our egg yolks. For this, I'm going to take our egg yolks for this. Now, some chefs will utilise the whole eggs to a custard. I don't really. I like to keep the recipe exactly as standard, like when I used to do at college, really. So we got... Uh, egg yolks, get rid of our shell out of there. And it's usually, as a rule of thumb, every 100 mils of liquid is one medium egg, like that. So you just take our nice little eggs. Now, you'll find this time of year, particularly 
with all the nightmare the egg producers have been having, bringing the birds inside and everything else, the shells have got much, much thinner, usually enough. That's because of the diet and everything else that they've been on. So you'll probably notice that if you use it. Look, uh, the, the shell seems to crack a lot easier than it ever used to do. But you just... There we go. Just crack them in there. So we're going to use eight egg yolks for this. Keep the whites, of course, because these are brilliant for meringues. You can freeze them. So, well, I like to keep the shells because they're brilliant to stop slugs in your garden. You just crush them up all around your cabbages. It'll stop the slugs getting them. So that's that. Natural little barrier. So now we can start to warm this up a little bit. Now, as this is starting to warm up, then we add our sugar. Now, sugar's an interesting thing with our custard. You wouldn't think of that. You just think normal custard is standard recipe. For one litre of custard, it's usually eight ounces of sugar. You've got to decide what you want to do with this. If it's a classic custard, it's the standard recipe for sugar. If you want to turn this into ice cream and you want to add things like honey and you want to add things like alcohol, both of which act as like a de-icer as it's freezing. So you reduce the amount of sugar down. And so often with recipes like rum and raisin ice cream, because the raisins are sweet, the rum's alcoholic, of course. You then take the sugar and you almost put two tablespoons in here. You hardly use any of it because there's, there's obviously sugar in everything else. But you need to think about what you're going to be doing with it. Because if you just take, take a standard recipe for ice cream and use a standard recipe for sugar, so often it won't set when it's freezing, so as it's churning. So you add the sugar as this starts to come up to the boil, not earlier, otherwise it starts to cure the egg yolks. You'll end up with little yellow spots in that you'll never get rid of. So once you've done that, go on wandering off on the phone or nipping to the loo or right in the garden or in the lawn, just make it as soon as you add the sugar. Once you add this, we can then pour the hot mixture onto our egg yolks. Now this is where we can take that vanilla pod, like that, take that out, leave that to one side. That's done its job. Now you can also see on this, there's loads of bubbles on here. Now those bubbles will actually help you for this next bit. Because what you then do is you start to warm this up. And this is the crucial bit. You don't want to split this. Now classically, at college, we would do this with a wooden spoon, mainly because the lecturer would like to see you suffer, because you'd be watching this like a hawk, but also the fact that we used to have really rubbish aluminium pans when we were at college, and you used to use a whisk. Any, any catering student back when I was at college will know, back in the 80s and 70s and 80s, will know that if you made a custard using a whisk, it used to turn the custard a lovely shade of grey as you were whisking it. So what you do is you use a wooden spoon. However, the more you do, or more custard you make, the more you can utilise the whisk, but the more you can utilise the bubbles in here. So ideally you want this to coat the back of the spoon. And what you want to do is just take your time at this. You can see the bubbles in here. Now the most important thing is this doesn't boil. If it boils, it's ruined. It goes like scrambled eggs. So you need to make sure you've got everything with you. Or nearby, we've got our sieve there. I've got a bowl over here with ice. If I was making masses of this stuff, as in loads, the quantity, there's so much residual heat in this as I make this custard. If I don't cool it down as quick as possible, either over a bowl of ice like that or pour it into a tray, what will happen is it will continue cooking and you'll often make this in big volumes and chefs will know about this in restaurants, and you come back and it's split and curdles because the amount of liquid in there just keeps getting hotter, even though it's not on the heat. So just keep your eye on it. Now, as it starts to heat up, you can then double-check this with a spoon like that, and it wants to coat the back of the spoon. So you can see the mixture there. It's still quite liquid. Now, it's about 70, 75 degrees as it starts to thicken. So we can then change it to a whisk if you want. Just keep whisking it. Either way, whatever you use, whether you use a whisk or a wooden spoon, just keep your eye on it. I'll just turn that up a little bit. There we go. Like that. And I always try and do it in a, a wider shaped pan. You don't want anything that's too tall because you've got to remember that mass has all got to be heated up. And there's only one heat element at the bottom. So try and get in the habit of using a pan like this so you can see things happen a little bit better, a little bit easier. Now you can utilise this for so many different things once you've made it. If you add a little bit of 
corn flour or flour to the eggs and the sugar mixture, you've got that creme patissiere. But look, now it's starting to come together. I can see this is happening quite quickly. Once you get to that stage, you can see, look at the texture of it now. It goes this lovely velvety texture. Keep it on the heat a little bit. And it's almost five degrees from being perfect and ruined. So it's practice, but it's all about doing this. Just put it on the heat, take it off the heat. Get in the habit of that rather than turning the heat down. But look, you can see now as you just coat the back of the spoon, it's not far off. Another 10 seconds, probably. Once you get to that stage, as it starts to thicken. Now, I flavoured this with vanilla, but you can use things like... I'm serving it with a crumble, but you can use things like saffron in this, even for a dessert. It's wonderful. But look at that. And then you can take your custard, pour it into your bowl. Now, you can tell when the... Custard is right. If I show you the base of the pan, look what's happening there. It almost goes like scrambled egg. You see that? If I leave it on the heat, you'll see what will happen. And it will actually go like scrambled egg, look. So it goes this really... When the texture's really thick and scrambly. That, and you know it's about perfect for the texture that you've got there. And you can see the little bits in there. There's the little cooked bits of egg. Once you get to that stage, we can then cool it down. Like that. And that sits in there. Now, I'm serving this with a nice little crumble. I always cut my crumble with raw fruit. So I've chopped up the pears, the apples, mixed together with brown sugar and a little bit of butter. And then pop the fruit on raw in the dish and a standard crumble recipe, which is just your sugar, your brown sugar, your butter and your flour. And you put it over the top and you cook it for a good 45 minutes, an hour, in a hot oven. And you end up with your classic fruit crumble. And it's the sticky bit around the edge is what you want as well. But then, of course, you serve it with your classic custard. And once it's made, you want to reheat it. Just reheat it very, very gently, like that. But you can see it's now coated the back of a spoon, back of a ladle, it's beautiful and thick. And we just take our classic custard and serve it with it. So there we have it. A little masterclass in making one of the most iconic things you can make as a pastry chef. Done. Now, there's nothing you'd like to learn about a little masterclass, so do get in touch. We'll see if we can help out right here on the show. Time now for a quick break, but join me again in a couple of minutes when the very talented Knox will be showing us how to make a legendary pork pie. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, I'll be impressing my guests with two recipes for beef very surely. But first, I'm joined by Richard Bertonet. And we're looking forward to a dish from a chef who wowed us with the mother of all beef wellingtons last time she was on the show, from the pie room in the Rosewood Hotel in London. It's Knox for Josie! <laughs> now, no pressure there, then. You built yourself up with this. Loads of people tried it. Loads of people can't make it as good as you. This beef wellington, pork pie. Yes, this time I'll be doing the wow. pork pie. Pork yeah. pie. So tell us about pork pie then, and and because you want me to do the filling, so yeah. let's explain about the filling first. And while I'm doing that, you can explain about the pastry. So what have we got here? Because you want me to chop all this lot up. Uh, so here I have pork shoulder, and yeah. then I have some minced uh, pork shoulder as well. Uh, I have a smoked bacon, mustard seeds, yeah. fennel seeds, and some sage. Okay. Oh, I forgot. Nearly forgot that I have. Uh... You nearly forgot, yeah, because I've been munching on. <laughs> <laughs> I've been munching on this. That you've got less than you had before when you brought it in. You've got this. This. This is the hock. Yeah, this is the the ham hock that right. I, I cook as well. Okay. So now the, it's all about the pastry, like the bread man over there as well. Yes. Not just about the filling. And taking so, tips. So tell us about the the, the pastry itself then, because this is this is your hot water paste. So the hot water paste, how I do? I put uh, the the flour. So I got the flour. Uh, I got the salt. 
and then I will put the egg, the egg mix on it. Uh, put the egg mix and there, it makes it like a nice crumbly. And then while I'm doing that one, I have the water. So you need to have water and then I use the, the lard or you can use your, the leaf lard that I'm gonna be using. Uh, and then I have rosemary. So rosemary give the flavor. So you yep. can use other, you, you wanna have uh, some thyme, any flavor that you like to have as a flavor for the pastry. So but the water you that. heat up, this, is, this yes. is what gives the pastry its unique Texture but appearance. Doesn't yes, it? and that's why it's called the hot water pastry yep. because it's get it from the from the hot water that you're gonna be boiling. And then when you have your mix, and then when you, so in water you're gonna in the hot water you have the leaf flat and then your flavor of the, of your herbs. Yep. Uh, yep. And then you take it off, you strain it off the the herbs so that it's not gonna have, and then you mix it together with the hot water. But you need to use a spoon because it's quite gonna be hot. Yep. And then okay. straight away. I'll make sure and do this properly because this is going in Richard's car because he's gonna use it for his cooking lesson tomorrow. <laughs> You, so explain, you, you're going to bring this one that we've got over here, because this is the dough itself. Yeah. So you can explain to me what you have over, over here, then. So this is a mixture that uh, I've done uh, with the, with the, from the dough. As you can see, even the colour, you can tell yeah, the, the colour is nicely. And as well, it's so nice, the texture. Uh, that you can get because of the soft of the, of the leaf lard. Yeah. But if you have the other the other lard, it won't be as soft as this one as well yeah, when, yeah. You do, when you're doing it. But you leave, you make your, your hot crust and you leave it rest after? Yes, after cooking it, it, after making, sorry, after making uh, the pastry dough, yeah. then you need to chill it down. Uh, I don't, I don't... Because otherwise the fat will start to come out if it's in the room temperature. So yeah. you just cover it up and cool it in the... In the it is actually the quite difficult to work with if you don't chill it down as well, isn't it? So... It's, it will be difficult because the fat when it's hot, it's gonna start to come out. Shape it so there. yeah, shape it as well. So when you cool it down, you still retain those fats inside there from the from the. So this is this pastry. is the filling that you you kindly brought with us. But now this is the this is the trick to. So the pie itself, you're gonna make these. So off you go and tell us how you make one of these hand risen pies then. So I have uh, the the dollies here, as you can see. Uh, yeah. So this, as you know, the it's, it's called the hand raised pie, yep, pork yep. pie. So because we're using, uh, this is what they've been using they use in the old days, and that's what we're still keeping uh, using it. What do so, the French call this? It's called a dolly in the UK. Pie dolly. Uh... Le dolly. Le dolly. <laughs> Le dolly. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Predictable. Predictable. <laughs> Le dolly. Because... Yeah, right. so with this one, with the door, that's why, as you can see, it's, got, it's, it's a nice uh, shaped door. And then I'm going to be in this one and then hand raising it. Well, go on, then. I'm, I'm well. going to get sure you works. to do it, so okay. off you go. Do it now, sir. Yeah, off you go. Go, go for it. Go let, me for go, it. let me take the one which I have. Still. Go for it. Come on, can I get, can I get the, the Frenchman to do one with you? With you yes. Oh, that would be amazing. Up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Le Dolly. There you go. Right. So you need a little bit of flour. Yes. So I'll just put a little bit of flour on here because you know, you know. Thank you, thank you, thank you. There you go. There Not you go. too much, just a touch. Yeah. yeah. And your Dolly need to have. Uh, a touch of the flour as well. So you need the, you start off with just a little bit bigger than the just dolly. Just a little so. bit than a dolly. Yes, it's always important so that when you press it down. Yeah. And then. Okay. Yeah, is there right? Yeah. Okay. So now you need to up. use to press it down. Yep. This is where the magic starts. See. Yeah. All the way down. And then you lift it up, and then you check. So my one. It's just need a touch more. And then when you're using it, you can tell if there's maybe the, the side that's need to be a little bit pressed on that side. Yep, but okay. if it's fine, I think uh, my one just need a touch, just a touch. Yeah. And that's Feels, all. Yeah, not too thin, but... Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it's not too thin. This one is perfect. So now, as they say, hand raise, and then that's how you put your, your both thumbs in here. Yes, yep. as you... Just did it, and then you. Like Don't give me that look. I'm just looking about you. It's like it's like watching a ghost film. You remember that? <laughs> 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 just looking at it, going. No, I'm not standing behind you, helping you either. <laughs> I'm blushing now. <laughs> so as you can see, it's got a hole inside and uh, in here, and then that's yeah. when I put my meat in inside. Yeah. Okay. That's that one. So this is the mixture that we've got, which is the mustard seeds, the fennel seeds, the, the, the sage, everything else. I love this, love this. Right. Just and then we've, you've rolled out the top bits that we've got on here. So these are the top bits. Really interesting, oh, that, what that I flower does. I forgot one thing. I what would you like? Water, sorry. Water? water. Yes, a touch of I can water. give you plenty of water. I've got, I've got plenty of that. <laughs> 
You got the easy job there, James. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> there you go. So, and then we're going to make just a, a, a small lid. The rim. Thank you. On the pastry. There you go. You put some water on the side? Yeah. So the the this the rim is is bigger than this? Yes, the rim yeah. will be much will be bigger, bigger than the, the lid. Yeah. Okay. So you can crimp it. Yes, so that you can crimp it over. Okay. It's nice pastry, really? I love it. It's really, really nice to work with. If you're Yeah. He's on it, he's on it, he's on it. Look yeah. at the concentration on it. And then you start to close. Yep. Yeah. But the crimping is the key, though, isn't it? That's the key of... Can I be creative there. on mine, or...? No, well, when, whenever you go to the pie room, <laughs> the, the, the workmanship of the crimping is... I mean, it, it just... It's mind-blowing when you see it. So this time I'm not going to do the... I'm just going to do the... The, the classic one. one. The classic one. Because mm. the pork pie is all about the classic. Uh... This pastry, though, is amazing to work it's really with, isn't good. it? It's just a... Yeah, it's beautiful. Because all we've done with this with plain flour, but this is much, yeah, much easier to work with. It's lovely. Well, the ordinary flour is quite amazing stuff. I mean, yeah. you can use spell flour. You can use He's gone flour. rogue. He's done it slightly different. He's gone rogue. It's French style, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, so once we get to that stage... Yes. Then what? We've got some that over in the back over yeah. here. Yeah. We'll keep that one. That's for my dinner tonight. Thank you very much. That's Do for Ralph. Bring... <laughs> <laughs> Come here. So, James, <laughs> I give the... No, I'm going gonna, gonna to go bring these over. You didn't want to show these, because this is, this is what I love about chefs who bring in their own food, stuff like this. Do not touch chef. Do not touch Knox. Do not touch. Do not touch. Chef's label on the end of it. Look at this. So these have come from the restaurant. What have you done with these, then? What have you done with these? So this one, after that process, and then you have to egg wash. I uh, yeah. use uh, the, the egg to wash it. So I have already, which is already here, which is egg wash. But the main thing is you have to make sure you open the hole so that okay. where it's going to be the st as, as you seem. Yeah. And then for, and as well, the main thing is when you're gelling it, that's yeah. the more important part of it because you're going to need this one. After it's cooked, you cool it down and then you put your jelly yeah. inside. So how long do you cook these for? This one, you cook it for 25 minutes in the oven straight on After making them, can you bake them straight in the oven or do you let them rest before you You need you to rest a little bit uh, and then you egg wash and then uh, leave it in the fridge. Not for too, for too long, just for the egg yolk, uh, for the egg to dry and then you can be able to and cook it. I've got it. another okay. chef's tray that says, definitely, definitely do not touch, Knox. <laughs> there you go. And look at this. And look at these ones. So I'll leave you to serve this and, and cut them up however you want to do it. There's a knife there. But these are the ones. So how long do you bake these for then? Uh, yeah, so this one we bake uh, 25 minutes. Do you yeah. need to blow touch a little bit? Do you need... Uh, we cook it... Yes, just for the... We cook it for 25 minutes, uh, 185 degrees, uh, you know, in the oven. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want me to do? The, the look of oil. <laughs> <laughs> yes, just to give the, the colour. A glaze, the I'm shiny. I'm going to leave you to glaze these. I'm, yeah. I'm standing well out of the way of this. Okay, shall I we? I think they're hitting here. Oh, look at that. He glazed them to colour them yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, Clever. I'll tell you what, those people at your master's class tomorrow are going to be thinking, Pressure you better down. make sure it's right this. <laughs> It's amazing, then, isn't it? The blowtorch. Oh, it's beautiful. It's, it's the, one of the things, as a chef, you always learn. You always learn. You learn all the time. And the day you stop learning, you might as well yeah. give up, you know. It's, uh... I mean, how good do they look? And the jelly inside you put, how do you make your jelly? The pig strutter? Or is it uh... So the jelly, we make it, no, the jelly I use, we, we use the pig uh, from the ham hock. So yeah. Oh, the bone for the animal. From yeah, the yeah. hemhock, the... the and you reduce you it? You it down, yeah. yes. And then you add uh, more flavour as well uh, in the in the, in the the liquid yeah, yeah. from the hemhock. Well, that's I'll what let you do. cut one and we'll just serve it on the side And then this. you can add maybe some red wine, because this one we put some red wine as yeah, well yeah, to yeah. reach... I'll let you cut one down the middle. Meanwhile, I'm going to put these in, because these will be on eBay later. My type of food. Look how good this is. Look how good oh, that is. Yes. Can I get another one? I think this one. But you're not happy with that one? No. All right. Ralph. What did you want? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's beautiful. 
It should be, because they don't... Yeah. Happy with that one? Oh, the jelly. The jelly, yeah. Well, then I'll let you turn it for the money shot over there. Open it out that way. Look at that. So there you have it. Give us the name of this, this dish. So this is a hen-raised pork pie. Bravo. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Right, I'm going to pick that one. I love that. Chef. <laughs> <laughs> you get to dive into that. So let's have a look at this then. And like I said, you, the restaurant, you serve these hot as well, particularly at winter time. Oh. Yeah, winter time we always have... Uh, uh, we have the whole year, but in winter time we sell a lot of this one because, you know, you're coming in, it's, it's cold outside, you come inside, you have a hot pork pie. It's, it's amazing. Amazing thing to have. The smell is incredible. It's one of the best pot pies I've eaten. Oh. <laughs> pastry is oh. wrong. Mm. Pastry's delicious, isn't it? Mm. Nox, everybody. Brilliant. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Right, uh, we've still got time for one more final dish, so join us after the break. We'll be treating all of my guests to two show-stopping beef Chinese dishes with egg fried rice. I'll see you in a bit. Fill up on pot pie first. Welcome back to the last part of the show, but I'm back in the kitchen with all my guests. Richard, Knox, Denise, Duncan, Renette, all of them all together. Yes. Yes. And for my final dish, I thought I'd treat them all to three recipes for this one. Three Chinese recipes, really. We're going to do deep-fried crispy chilli beef. I'm going to do beef and black bean sauce as well. And then I'm going to do egg-fried rice. Amazing. So the first thing, Richard, I'm need you to get on and do the I Szechuan. If you can crush yep. the Szechuan pepper with there. Nox, I'm going to put you to good use in a second because I want you to deep-fry this beef. So with the beef here, you can use whatever cut of beef you want, but I've just got in here some beautiful, beautiful fillet as a little treat. And we're going to take our piece of beef like this and slice them into sort of thin pieces as we go like that. Now, I think this is the first time ever we've had three guests that have been here, all of which have treaded the boards in on the theatre. All done different things, but all... You, we talked about Boiling Point earlier, Vinette, as well. We talked about that. You guys have never seen Boiling Point, have no. you? No, but I am definitely going to watch it now, because it uh, sounds and, brilliant. And this is one of the things we talked about. It was all done in sort of one take, one camera, mm. all the way... How on earth... They're just shaking their head. How, wow. on earth do you, how on earth do you prepare for something like that? Oh, well, it was very stressful. Um, but we rehearsed for five days, and then... Um, all you get is five days. days. That's nothing. I know. And to say that like, all the dialogue was improvised. I mean, I was hiding crib notes in the fridge when the camera panned off. Like, <laughs> how, many cameras, how many cameras were there that filmed it? Just one. Just one? Yeah. They did everything wow. with one camera? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was a bit of a mad... So, you, I mean, I'm presuming you had your crib notes, but you're allowed to go off a little bit and do you... Were you allowed to do that? Yeah, I mean, the dialogue was improvised, so obviously we couldn't wildly change the action, otherwise our DP, Matt Lewis, would be a yeah, bit exactly. thrown off. But then how could you prevent talking over each other, the actors, if, you, if you're improvised? Was that just kicking tricky? each other underneath. Like, I'm, doing to, like I'm going to Richard <laughs> now, stop <laughs> that. Exactly. Yeah. We, did, we had... I can't remember how many radio mics, but it was crazy, so I think they just... Fade in and fade yeah, out. Yeah, they just went with it. They won, they won um, a Biffra Award, the sound team, because it was such a mad... I was going to say, that's incredible. Yeah. They do a lot of that in the theatre, actually, when you're on stage, because everybody's got a mic on and there's a lot of going on. And as soon as you walk off stage, obviously, you back to normal life and you're chatting to people and they're really clever because they have to bring your faders up and down all the time, otherwise they can hear you what you're doing. Yeah. Especially if you're going for a wee-wee. You don't want that oh, big no. fade. <laughs> <laughs> Because, I mean, you're busy, you've been doing festivals in the summer as well, you're still doing all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, me and the boys, me and the Blue Boys, um, we're lucky, you know, we've still been working lots, we do lots of gigs up and down the country, and still in Europe as well, and actually we're flying off to uh, Italy this week to do a gig over there, and then right. Dubai the following week. So we still get a chance to get to fly around the place and do, you know, eat different types of food in different countries, which I love. Because I know, I mean, music is a big love of you, Denise, as well, not just on the theatre, but also, you know, DJing now. 
Yeah, well, I... You've now got gigs all over the place. It's amazing. Thank you, Dunk. It's yeah. amazing. I mean, I, yeah, I love it. I mean, I've always loved music, and particularly I like house music. In fact, I was one of the original ravers back in the day. Um, <laughs> so it's never left me. And actually, it's really nice now because I've, you know, learnt to DJ and I'm doing a lot of festivals. And, and also, I've started remixing some of the old classic house tracks as well, which I've really enjoyed. Right. Because I feel like it's ingrained in me because I kind of grew up on it. So I've reverted back to doing all the music that I love. And it's fun, it's great. And, you, and again, it's opened so many doors for me. I've had the opportunity to DJ for some great people. And well, we're gonna, we, we, we talked earlier about this. I mean, you've now collaborated together. Those people who are just waking up on a Saturday morning, when the, those people who have been raving too much on a Saturday morning, who are just waking up, who are just waking up. You, you, tell us about the, the collaboration that both of you have done, because this stems from a, a, an album that you've got and you've been working on. This is something that's very, very dear to everybody's hearts, really, when it comes to yeah, this. Yeah, we're raising money for the Macmillan Cancer Trust with all profits from the single that we've recorded, which is the Burt Bacharach cover of That's What Friends Are For. Um, so, yeah, we just wanted to put it out. When we, we recorded it, then listened to it, we're like, it's so nice that, like, the sentiment behind it and everything and the message behind it, and we just felt it was really fitting for the charity, who have been a massive support to my family, past and present, because I've got a current family member dealing with cancer. So what's, what's the out, what's the out, can we talk about the album? What, what is it based on? Is it based on a musical thing? What, what is it, what, what's, what's your theme of the, 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 the music of it? What... It's the soundtrack to my life, basically. So I put my... Which I've known you for a while, which could, and Duncan's laughing, that could mean anything. <laughs> Well, it is, <laughs> and that's what I like about it, because it's got a little bit of everything. Um, because I just wanted to put something out... I've, you know, I was approached back in the day, in the 90s, to do pop, you know, recordings, and, and I said no to it, because, I mean, I've grown up doing musical theatre, and I love music, um, and I just wanted to record the songs that I genuinely love, that are just what I always listen to, and they, sort of, they relate to something in my life or a point in my life. So it is basically the soundtrack to my life. And every song relates to a moment in my life, be it a past love or a first travel experience. Um, but pop? Mm, like, no, it's not pop. There's a lot of classic. Mixture, there was a mix, yeah. a real mix. Don't heard some of it. Yeah, it's really good. Um, so, yeah, so I will release it next spring. And again, I've never, you know, I had my little stab at trying to do pop when I was very young, like a teenager. Yeah. And it never really kind of suited me. Um, but this suits me, because this is, like, classic music, like, cla more, you know, classical. Exactly. Right, we're just going to recap on here. Knox is busy over there in the corner. We've got on here our deep-fried beef. Uh, and our, we've, got, we've got our carrots. And the idea with these carrots, you just put the carrots in, in the mixture, and, and that sort of deep-fries as well with the beef. You see, you've got the beef and everything else. And that sits in there. And then we're going to reduce this down. In here, I've got some gluten-free soy. Right. If I made this at home, my smoke alarms would be going crazy right now. <laughs> <laughs> What's the secret? Well, <laughs> you, you're more or less live here, so you might as well do it here as well. So. <laughs> uh, but the, the key to this, I think anything with, with this side of cooking, invest in a really good pan, get it nice and hot. Um, and people never really get it hot enough. So they'll always try to put everything all in together. And see, what you do is you take the beef like that, a little bit of oil, but we're going to use either ground oil or vegetable oil, so you want sort of a, a neutral oil. You wouldn't use things like olive oil in this sort of stuff. It, you, you wouldn't be using that. And we take our ginger and our garlic. That goes in there. We've got our beans. That's going to go in there as well. And then in we go with our mixture, the rice wine, vinegar, or well, rice wine, that goes in there. Tiny bit of the sesame. Tiny bit of that in there. And then, Richard, you can chuck the beef back in. This, this beef can go in there. Uh, that one, that will go in there. That can go straight in. You can smell that. Oh, it's so amazing. good. Fermented black beans, there we go. Gorgeous. And then, we're just going to stir all that lot together. Wow. But that's that one done. Ooh. Richard can then chuck that, that in that one. Amazing. Yeah, I was just about to say. So that's that one. How are we doing, Knox? You right? One. Yes, I'm good. Thank you. You're on our final batch? Yeah. That's yours? Final that's mine. <laughs> there you go. So fill it all up. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, so wow. that's your beef and your black bean. Pour the sauce on it. Lovely. You could put a little bit, if you wanted to thicken this up, with a little bit of... Gorgeous. Cornflake. You can do it, but that's that one done. The beef is over here. So egg fried rice. Now, I know you've tried 
Egg fried rice. I did. I've heard. <laughs> Your legendary bit, egg fried rice. Bit of a mistake. I used uh, sesame oil to cook the rice in, which I've just <laughs> learned today is a no-no. <laughs> <laughs> and you burnt the pan? I burnt the pan and yeah. the rice. And the rice. So the way you cook it is you prepare all the ingredients. You've got your spring onion. That's it. You're reducing that down. At least a little bit longer, just about another 30 seconds before it catches. So we've got our rice. We've got our cold rice. We've got our eggs. We use a little bit of sesame oil for a nice little bit of... That's perfect. That can come off. Now you can put the beef in there. Sorry. The so beef can go in. Do you have in. to have the rice cold? Rice is cold. Why? Why does it have to be cold? Stir it or you don't. Just does. Uh, just, just, just... <laughs> it happens that way. OK. <laughs> so then what we do is we take our eggs. So while your rice Ooh. is in here, and you yeah. want it sort of catching, not catching too much, just catching a little bit. Not burning. <laughs> not, yeah. not burning, Duncan. No, it's a big difference. Yeah. And then what you do is you it's take the your... oil. Did your smoke alarms go off? Yeah, everything went off. <laughs> <laughs> My mother went off. <laughs> Sesame oil goes in. You go in there. If it's up to you whether you put soy in, you put a little bit of soy in. We can then beat up our eggs, because this happens very, very quickly. So this has got the sesame and the soy in there. You, just, you don't have to put soy in there, but the sesame certainly. Then you pop in your eggs, straight in. Then pop in your spring onions, straight in. And now mix it all together. Keep it on the heat. Keep frying it. And is it on a high heat? High heat, yeah. Does that look better than yours, Dan? It looks a lot better than mine. Nicer <laughs> colour than mine. <laughs> mine was a little bit too brown. <laughs> and then you've got your egg fried rice. Oh, wow. wow, beautiful. Like Do you want beef in this? And then you've got our other one. We'll garnish that with a little bit of coriander. And then we've got our final one, which is, look at this, <coughs> crispy chilli beef. Oh, wow. wow. With this glaze. Oh, this <laughs> this, Teamwork, guys. this glaze. Teamwork. Oh. I mean, that is amazing. This Stunning. is crispy chilli beef. OK, a little bit of coriander. And um, talking of restaurant kitchens, I wouldn't like to pay for this brigade to value how much this has just cost you to cook with these two stood by the side of me. But look, you've got your deep fried crispy chilli beef, your egg fried rice, and your beef and black bean sauce. Done. Amazing. <laughs>